five. Let's start with the excellent news this week, which is that top hats are a form of PPE. Four. You are wrong. Your lockdown policies when it comes to international travel are wrong. One could argue that Laurel Hubbard taking a place at the Olympics has displaced a female athlete and that in itself might be a fairness deficit. Could not the whole airline industry be designated a pilot scheme? Boom, boom. One. We have liftoff. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So the UK's Office for National Statistics just quietly released data showing almost 9 in 10 UK adults now have antibodies against COVID. Among the most vulnerable, the over 65s, that share is 95%. And these are the results of tests a fortnight ago, since when millions more have been vaxxed. The UK is clearly at or very close to herd immunity, a long-established scientific phrase which for months our scientists were banned from using. More than 10 times more people in Britain are now dying from flu and pneumonia than from Covid. Yet still, our 21st of June Freedom Day has come and gone. And even the new light at the end of the tunnel, July the 19th, may turn out to be yet another oncoming train of crashing disappointment. After so many letdowns, who can say it won't? We just learned that 60,000 will be able to sing and hug at Wembley football matches, co-pilot. Yet ordinary folk can't have a family party with singing or hugging or even dancing, even if they're all double jabbed. How can that be right? Meanwhile, the collateral damage of lockdown continues to mount. The crushed businesses, the lost jobs, the anguish, the heartache. The already 5 million long NHS waiting list ever lengthening, the lost rights of youthful passage, the sheer indiscriminate suppression of joy. And despite the rise in the so-called Delta variant, Alison, the Covid death rate has barely moved. Why, oh why, must this lockdown go on? I think I was going to say I'm speechless, but that wouldn't be very good for a podcast, would it? (laughs) Sound like you. Let's start with the excellent news this week, which is that top hats are, are a form of PPE, Halligan, because we've just worked out that if you go to uh, Royal Ascot in a morning suit, morning dress rather, then you're afforded full protection against the coronavirus. But if you're ordinary parents going in T-shirt and jeans to your primary school child's sports day, then that's not allowed because it's extremely dangerous. Oh, look, Liam, what can we say? I mean, I think every week, don't we, we say this is the tipping point. I just feel I am done now. I am done with these clowns squandering the extraordinary vaccine advantage we have over other countries. You wouldn't know it. Of course, it was Freedom Day on Monday. You know, I suggested, in fact, on GB News that people might send their masks to Boris at number 10. I think a lot of people took up that idea. So I expect Dylan the dog is uh, running wild through a kind of room full of used masks. (laughs) (laughs) And as our liberation was cancelled on the basis of no data whatsoever, or as we subsequently learned, manipulated data, as Planet Normal pointed out last week, In the United States, most of the states have lifted all restrictions. And I think I sent you the lovely link, Liam. Bruce Springsteen performed on Monday night to a packed, maskless, ecstatic audience at Madison Square Gardens. And he sang a marvellous song about learning to live again and was cheered to the echo. And as you said in your rather beautiful introduction, I mean... 86.6% of the adult population in the UK have antibodies to COVID. We're not even trusted to fly to a country which has got less virus than we have. And we'll come to all the different things. But I think actually peak Marie Antoinette this week was the, the quiet decision shuffled through to allow in up to 3,000 wafer officials to come to Wembley for the semi-finals and the final of the European 
championship, not subject to any of the quarantine rules that ordinary British people are subject to. And I think this is rather marvellous, you know, because I think this may finally be it. I think even the very most law-abiding, rule-obeying British people are going to look and think, what the hell is going on? I think you're right. I still think the opinion polls that show a majority of the public wanting lockdown to continue are the result of leading questions yeah, in those opinion polls. You know, Do you want lockdown to continue if necessary? Yes. Okay, you must support lockdown then under all circumstances. I think that, as you say, the us and themism, which is emerging, whether it's people at Wimbledon with punnets of strawberries and cream being PPE, top hats at Ascot <laughs> being PPE, or even a football scarf, and a football program rolled up in the back pocket of your jeans being PPE, there are going to be many, many people who've had their weddings ruined, who've had the the school leaving of their kids ruined, massive rites of passage in the over the summer ruined by ongoing lockdown rules when other parts of society are free of those rules. I think that really will start to wind people up. And I've just been watching... PMQs, Alice, and Prime Minister's questions, because we record this on Wednesday afternoon, don't we? Yeah. And I was actually amazed because even though the topics raised were, you know, extremely worthwhile topics, there was domestic violence and Robert Buckland's mere culprit on the fact that so many rapes go unreported and charges are so often dropped or not even investigated. These are very important subjects. But Freedom Day has just been cancelled. And That was barely reflected, if reflected at all, during the high point of the parliamentary week in the cockpit of the nation. No MP asked the Prime Minister, why did you delay Freedom Day? At least not in the first part of PMQs that I saw, which is the part the public will pay most attention to. It's almost as if our political classes are calling off a truce and let's not question the ongoing lockdown. It's left to you know, recalcitrant, awkward people in the media, people like me and you, people that are constantly put on the naughty step by polite society to keep questioning why lockdown is continuing. But I think out there, many, many, many people are questioning it. It's not just the travel industry now launching a day of action, bringing legal uh, proceedings against the government to try and get these very restrictive travel rules listed. It's not just The the hospitality industry, those who've had their businesses destroyed by lockdown. I think a lot of moderate mainstream voters are thoroughly narked at what's going on. And that, I think, is a big reason. That and massive overspending and lack of grip of our public finances. I think that the main reasons why the Tories lost the Chesham and Amersham by-election Yes, it was partly about planning and nimbyism, so-called too many houses being built. Yes, of course, it was about HS2, that ridiculous white elephant project that rips through the Buckinghamshire countryside without stopping of no use to people who live there. But I think it was mainly about drift and a lack of grip and a lack of coherence when it comes to lockdown. And as you say, Alison, squandering our massive vaccine advantage. Yeah, it was really interesting, Liam. So back in May, I I wrote in my Telegraph column that I really didn't feel like voting in the local elections. You may remember, and of course, a few people wrote in to chide me and said, come on, you know, women died for the vote, you should be voting. But I was feeling in a real, a plague on all your houses mood, you know, thinking how useless our political class was. But what was really interesting to me was how many readers wrote in violent agreement with my sentiment. And these were readers, Liam, who had backed the Conservatives really enthusiastically with full hearts in the general election of December 2019. And suddenly here they were reeling because the sensible centre-right party they thought they had elected was behaving like a totalitarian, high-spending socialist cabal that was, you know, even beyond the hemp-fume dreams of Jeremy Corbyn. And 
some of the people who were writing to me. <laughs> hemp fumed dreams. <laughs> hemp fumed dreams. I mean, can you imagine Corbyn? He'd, he'd be loving it, wouldn't he? Do you prepare for phrases like that, or you just make them up <laughs> off the top of your head? Off the top of my head. You know me. You know, when I get my little novelist hat on. So, yes, it wasn't just lifelong Tory members. Even party donors were saying they had just cancelled their membership in disgust at the government's appalling response to COVID-19. And as you said earlier, all these opinion polls showing overwhelming support for the government. But, you know, our own private focus group, considerable focus group, actually, of readers and listeners was painting another picture. And so when I, when, when I heard the Cheshire and Amersham by-election result, I thought, oh, yes, now, finally, the feelings that, you know, that I was privy to are starting to surface. And I, you know, we've had various political commentators, you know, wondering, was it Brexit? You know, was it a lot of bitter Remainers in, in, in the Chilterns? getting back at Boris. But that isn't right, Liam, because I looked it up and the late Dame Cheryl Gillen, who held the seat with great distinction, actually, a very handsome majority since 1992. And, and Cheryl was a passionate Leave supporter and she secured 30,850 votes in the last general election, which gave her a stonking 16,000 majority ahead of her Lib Dem rival. And actually, this is going to be the most Velma moment of the week. Do you want a bit of a bit of a Scooby reaction? <laughs> so Velma says that the Lib Dems, which, which took the seat, who took that seat from the Tories. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Velma does COVID. You're say, saying Velma's now suddenly a sophologist as well. What was that nice Bob man who used to do all the... All Bob the, Worcester. The, oh, lovely. I loved him. So Velma's now taking over from Bob Worcester. But the, so the Lib Dems, to win that seat, they gained 7,000 votes. But if you looked at it, co-pilot, they came largely, I suspect, from the 5,500 votes that Labour lost, because, of course, Labour lost its deposit, astonishingly, yeah. and the 1,500 votes that the Greens lost. Now, the Conservatives lost over 16,000 votes. But if you look at it closely, and if you, as I said, I can't even say the word cephologist, but I'm going to try. I suspect that many, many Conservatives in Chesham and Amersham didn't vote. They didn't turn out to vote because they are increasingly dismayed and disgusted because they've held off seeing their grandchildren. They want to go abroad. I mean, look, Callaghan, it's flaming June and we've got the heating on, all right? <laughs> Why would anyone want to go abroad? I can't understand it myself. I like camping in the rain. Why not be in a rain-lashed caravan in Cleethorpes? I mean, you know, so we can't even go to a Greek Nothing island. Nothing wrong with Cleethorpes. Nothing wrong with Cleethorpes, no, exactly. I spent lots of time in Skegness, actually, which is so embracing. But yeah, anyway, so all those nice, you know, good, decent Tory voters in Chesham and Amersham who would quite probably quite fancy going to Corfu or something, they're double jabbed. Matt Hancock says... The whole point of vaccination is to get us out of lockdown, but he won't consider lifting the quarantine for those who have been jabbed twice. Although, although it is starting now, isn't it? Are they? Do you think they're, that they're starting to realise that they cannot maintain this absurd position? Yeah, Matt Cry Freedom Hancock. <laughs> I, I I do think the politics is shifting, and that's I say again why I was so amazed that. Basically, no one mentioned this at PMQs, you know, just days after the Freedom Day was effectively postponed. It, it, it really struck me as a huge miss by the political class. Didn't no one say, why are you letting in all these fo thousands of football officials? No, no, no one that I saw. I, I was watching PMQs during my GB News show with Gloria DiPiero. And, and part of what we do on Wednesday is watch PMQs. And then we talk to our political editor Darren McCaffrey about it. And we watched, you know, most of PMQ. So it, it may have happened at the very end, but I certainly didn't see it. But I do think the politics of this is cranking up. I just wanted to go back to that travel industry day of action, Alison, because it originally it was just Michael O'Leary of Ryanair, who's never understated, of course, a very fast talking Irishman who is often, you know, meant to say, well that's just O'Leary wanging on again. Albeit, you know, he runs a very, very significant airline these days. 
But now you've got some of the, the really big players joining Ryanair and Manchester Airports Group, which launched this legal action. You've got the International Airlines Group itself, which owns British Airways. Mm. You've got Virgin Atlantic. TUI. They're also now backing the legal mm. challenge. Indeed, you've got the travel agencies like TUI and ABTA, which is the umbrella group for travel agencies. This is no longer a sort of rag bag of people. This is now the UK travel industry establishment squaring up to the government and saying, you are wrong. Your lockdown policies when it comes to international travel are wrong. They represent hundreds of thousands of employees between them and billions of pounds of revenue for gone. You know, the travel industry is one of our major sectors. We are one of the world's leaders in terms of the size of our airline industry, obviously, we've got some of the world's leading airports in the UK, and they are hurting very, very badly. They're worried now they're losing market share. They're worried about permanent damage being done. And yet still, still, the 19th of July, which is our new Freedom Day, is just penciled in. Still, even that could be taken from us. And I think if it is, I think the political backlash is going to be very, very significant. I think the notion that the majority of the country backs this, which I don't actually believe and haven't believed for a very long time, because I think the polls are not rigged, but skewed in the sense that the questions are posed in a leading way. But I think there'll be an explosion of concern and anguish and outrage. And I think a lot of people will just take matters in their own hands and say, nah, we've had enough of this. You know, their excuse, one of their excuses for the, I wrote in the column this week, did a sort of funny item about the have freedoms and the not have freedoms, this sort of class divide. And one of the ways they get around it, Liam, is they say that everything that, that you think that's outrageous, they call it a pilot scheme. So um, Michael Gove had, of course, had his own pilot scheme when he came back from Portugal and didn't have to quarantine. But a lovely Planet Normal listener called Alan wrote in and said, could not the whole airline industry be designated a pilot scheme? Boom, boom. <laughs> well, brilliant, Alan. I was going to steal it and claim it was me, but I thought, no, that would be wrong. That would be wrong. Let's give credit to Alan. We've had all the sort of our kind of statistical underpinning coming from every week from George, our NHS England insider. Do you just want to briefly mention what George is, Liam? So George is a senior source within NHS England, he or she has full access to the internal data. We don't disclose who George is, but we are very confident of the authenticity of the statistics George provides us. So that's why we report them. We can't independently verify them because by definition, we see them before they're published, if indeed they're ever published. Yes. So we put to George the things that all the scientists say on the, on the telly and George explains why it's nonsense. And I know Planet Normal listeners really appreciate that. Liam, there's exciting news from George this week. George now has their own Twitter account and you'll find George at George, lowercase g-e-o-r-g-e -E underscore stats, S-T-A-T-S. And George oh. says they are working on stuff to post and Planet Normal listeners can follow George on Twitter and trade ideas and, and feed back to us, which would be great. But I was looking at one of the doomsters, Liam, on the television. You've probably seen her. Professor Christina Pagel pops up all the time Indeed. on, as with, you know, old doomster himself, Neil Ferguson. And Christina Pagel was on the Channel 4 News and she is very against lifting any of the restrictions, really, much too dangerous. And she said that there were 200 COVID hospital admissions every day, and that was unacceptable. So I put this to George, and George said the average number of new patients admitted or diagnosed in hospital for the last two weeks is 168. But once again, she is omitting to mention that there are also COVID discharges from hospital just as a kind of quick update, Liam, to set the scene, really, for all these nobody being allowed to go on proper holidays, the green list is pathetically small, isn't it? You know, the number of places... Well, I don't know. I quite, I quite fancy Pitcairn. <laughs> is, that, is that where we're going? 
The Sandwich Islands, anyone? The South Sandwich Islands. You can't go to the North Side. So I told you I looked up the South Side Sandwich Island. <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't even any way to get to it. But anyway, so just a, a quick snapshot of the overall picture from George. There were just 1,300 COVID patients in hospital throughout all of England on Tuesday, and that is out of a total of 110,000 beds. George says the seven-day average is definitely flattening off. And this is, this is interesting, this bit, Liam. There are 104 new diagnoses in hospital, and that's the, what we call it. What's the word we call it? The in-hospital? Come on, Halligan. Oh, I can't remember. What is it? Nosocomial. Oh, God. So basically, we're, we are back to more patients. Nosocomial, zoonotic, <laughs> and gain of functions. <laughs> You don't actually know what these words mean. You just say them. Excuse me, I bloody do. I do. I do. Good job the dinner party season has been sort of cancelled for the next <laughs> 10 years because you'd be at the end of the table no sacomialing and zoonoticing and gain of functions in God. I know, I know. Setting the table alight with my scientific knowledge. Yeah. It is interesting, I think, that George says we've seen a return to more people being infected after admission to hospital than who are actually coming in with it. And the Northwest remains the main hotspot in terms of COVID occupancy, although even there the increase is showing early signs of slowing down. I found this very interesting. Just eight hospitals in England who have 30 or more COVID patients, Manchester, Lancashire, East Lancashire, Bolton, Birmingham, Leicester, Imperial and King's London. And all those hospitals, Liam, we know are in communities that are pretty resistant to the vaccine. Bolton, which was the first to become a Delta hotspot, is now trending down and East Lancashire seems to have peaked. So these are communities where there was more vaccine hesitancy than in most other parts of the UK. But some of that vaccine hesitancy has now waned and people have been taking the vaccine, right? They have, they have. But this is... This is the country which is denying the freedoms that other countries in Europe now have. 400,000 Germans have been to Mallorca in the last six weeks. We're not allowed to go anywhere. And this is the state of play. All those sunbeds pinched. <laughs> All those towels left on the beach where British towels may once have laid. Imagine all those kind of Kurtz and Helgers looking around, wondering where their competition is at 6am in the morning. This is why we come on holiday. <laughs> exactly. But they're not here. So just to finish what George says, this is a real, this is a real doozy, Halligan. COVID has pretty much gone from the rest of England. The Southwest has only 44 COVID patients in the entire region. The Southeast has 64 and in the whole of the east of England, where Copilot and I are, are 67. Does that sound, Halligan, like a country where you shouldn't be able to kind of dance at your child's wedding? Or mingle. <laughs> no mingling. Or hug. And you got to wear a face mask during your photos. And yeah, to walk down the aisle. I mean, this brings us full circle back to the introduction, doesn't it? We, on Planet Normal, we've gone along with everything the government's asked us to go along with, and we will continue to go along with it. We've had our double jabs. We've observed all the rules in our personal lives and indeed in our professional lives in terms of what we've been writing and broadcasting. But as you said, Alison, rightly, something seems to have gone wrong at the top of government when you can have what is a world-class vaccination programme, a vaccination programme of which this country is rightly proud, mm. and yet we don't seem to be taking advantage of it. It's almost as if the Prime Minister seems to be snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Well, my little rebellion, Liam, and I suspect I'll be joined by millions of other people, is I'm not wearing my mask because um, Monday was my Freedom Day. It's been upsetting me wearing it. And under the guidance, you are allowed to be exempt if your mask is causing you to be upset or distressed or causing you any mental health issues. So I'm not wearing mine. I'm obviously being respectful around more anxious people. But I have to say, 
it feels really good. And I think that the longer we go on wearing these masks, the more the kind of reign of fear will go on. And I think a lot of listeners are writing in and saying they too are not wearing their masks and they're getting a good reception. And also, you, you know I'm not a marcher, but I'm going to the Freedom March this Saturday. A little bit worried I'm going to be trampled by a police horse. But I'm just going, Liam, nothing to do with law breaking. I'm going because I'm going to stand there on that march and I'm going to say, for my children's sake, this will not go on. And this is this is not the country I think it is. We are lagging behind other democratic nations in restoring freedoms. And now the politicians have got to give our freedoms back. Hello, I'm Christopher Hope, but my pals call me Chopper, and you can too. Just dropping into my second favourite podcast to tell you about another Telegraph show, mine. As the Telegraph's chief political correspondent, I spend my days holding politicians to account and asking them about the things that affect you. I speak to the top politicians from across the political spectrum, commentators with their finger on the pulse, and of course, my talented colleagues at the Telegraph. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, please search Chopper's Politics wherever you're listening to this. Cheerio! New Zealand's Laurel Hubbard has become the first ever transgender athlete picked to compete at an Olympics. Officials have selected her for the women's weightlifting team for this summer's Tokyo 2020, after qualifying requirements were recently modified. Hubbard competed in men's events before coming out as transgender in 2013. Now, Dr Emma Hilton, who's a developmental biologist at Manchester University, has published research showing that treatment to suppress testosterone levels for 12 months, which is the International Olympic Committee's requirement for transgender women to compete, actually does little to suppress speed and strength. The muscle mass and skeletal and cardiovascular features of male-born trans competitors, according to Dr. Hilton's research, continues to give them a huge advantage over female-born rivals. Now, saying that this is unfair is to risk provoking trans activists, who can be extremely aggressive. But attempting to prove this with scientific research is, in the current political climate, even more courageous. When I first heard that Laurel Hubbard was taking part, I think it it was a a realisation of a a few years of investigation and study for me that, that this was a real possibility that we knew Laurel Hubbard certainly had Olympic potential for some time now. Um, And then when the selection finally came through, it was a chance to think about what that means, really. And so my approach really to thinking about how transgender women participate in, in sports has been to think about their development. Now, transgender women are born male and for the most part go through a male puberty. And what does that mean for their athletic potential? And how does that fit in with the regulations that we have around a protected female category? So my approach has been to think about transgender women and their development and look at what happens to, you know, their muscle, their strength, when in adulthood they suppress their testosterone levels, where testosterone has been the the hormone that's driven Um, their athletic potential. So what I did was I had a look for studies of transgender women who had suppressed testosterone during adulthood and looked for kind of before and after data on things like muscle mass and strength and tried to get a feel really for, you know, over the course of a year, which is what sports federations tend to place as their criteria for inclusion in the female category on the assumption that that generates parity with females. Um, To try and really look and think, well, what what is the extent of changes in trans women who have been suppressing testosterone for a year? And there's a a dozen or so studies that, that I and a colleague at the Karolinska in Sweden pulled together that show really over the course of at least a year and even up to three years, the loss of muscle mass and strength in trans women suppressing testosterone is actually quite small. 
and perhaps surprisingly so, really insufficient to cover what we know the baseline gaps between males and females. Your research shows that somebody like Laurel Hubbard, who competed as a weightlifter as a man before coming out as transgender in 2013, I believe, because she was born as a man, even though her testosterone levels are suppressed, the fact that her testosterone levels are suppressed only has a very small impact on her strength and explosive power. But the fact that she was born a man, so she has the skeletal features of a man and went through male puberty, that remains very, very important in terms of uh, ascertaining her success in an event like weightlifting. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct. There are lots of things that make a good athlete. Um, lots of different body systems involved. And my research and my data collection is focused on muscle mass and skeletal parameters. So things like height, you know, the length of your fingers and the length of your femurs. But the, the gap in weightlifting between males and females is, is very large compared to something like running. So there's around a 30% gap between males and females of the same size. So males and females who are the same height and weight, the males are 30% stronger. So this is really quite a big sporting gap. And, you know, transgender women, when they suppress testosterone, undergo a lot of different physiological changes. For example, their their hemoglobin levels drop. So hemoglobin is the, the molecule that carries oxygen around. So we might argue that in terms of cardiovascular capacity, they're experiencing greater changes than they are in terms of muscle mass and strength. And so, so this really keys into weightlifting and, and in terms of understanding how Hubbard might have experienced changes relevant to weightlifting and her potential in, in the female category. Now, last month, the Belgian weightlifter Anna van Bellingen, who will be competing in the same category as, as Hubbard, at Tokyo. Anna said that uh, if Hubbard was allowed to compete, it would be unfair on women and, quote, like a bad joke. She was at pains to point out that she supports the transgender community and the principle of inclusion, but she feels that inclusion shouldn't be at the expense of others. So your research basically backs up Anna Van Bellingen, right? Yes, I think that there is a, a fairness deficit here. And what do you think is going to be the reaction when Laurel Hubbard, it looks as if she's going to win the gold medal, competing against lots of female born competitors, even though she is now transgender, she is she, but she has the, the skeletal physique of a male born competitor. So just to be clear, I think Laurel Hubbard is unlikely to win a medal. Um, she's not in the senior female field that she's competing in. She's, she's not a, a medal contender. She's ranked seventh in the world, uh, which is uh, how she won a space at the Olympics. There's a lot of focus on who wins medals and who doesn't, as if that's the, that's the threshold that must be met in order to even start to evaluate fairness of competition the the premise being that if someone isn't winning then it doesn't really matter that they're competing you know sport at the olympics is kind of held up as the pinnacle of elite sport but this is an issue that shifts in a hierarchical fashion all the way down to grassroots entry level and so one could argue that laurel hubbard taking a place at the olympics has displaced a female athlete and and that in itself might be a fairness deficit. I, I guess we'll see. I've, I've, I've looked at the International Weightlifting Federation rankings too, um, but sports pundits tell me that she might actually win a medal because there are rules that only one lifter per category per country can take part. But I, t- I take your point. Of course, she's keeping out another Kiwi weightlifter. And even if she comes fifth, you know, she's displacing the person who would have come fifth otherwise, potentially in their mind. I'm not saying that that hypothetical person does think that, but there may be a perceived unfairness. What do you think the dangers are, Dr. Hilton? I know you've expressed support for the transgender community. 
uh, getting involved with sport, as has indeed Sharon Davis, who's previously appeared on the Planet Normal podcast. But you are, as a scientist, you're putting your research out there and it's it's peer reviewed. And obviously, you're a highly reputable scientist at a very highly reputable institution. So what are your concerns about where this may end up in terms of transgender women taking part in sport? What could it mean for female sport? I am concerned about how trans people can participate in sport. And I absolutely want to reiterate that it's not about removing trans people's opportunities to participate in sport. What we're arguing or discussing or debating here is how to fairly categorise people within sports to make sure that everyone has, you know, what the, the sporting values of fairness of competition. So, so I absolutely support the finding of solutions. In order to, to do that, we need to be able to discuss these things. We need to be able to be open about data, what that data means. We need to be able to ask uncomfortable questions that some people don't want to engage with even because even asking those questions is viewed as being exclusive. Now, in sports, being exclusive is how we achieve fairness. You need look no further than something like the Paralympics, which is the ultimate exclusionary sport with really strict criteria on who can be in which category. And that's done to ensure fairness. So, so it's a really tricky kind of subject to, to talk about. But I, I really don't want anyone to think that people who talk about these things are, at, are, are, you know, campaigning for the removal of trans people in sport and trying to achieve fairness for everyone you were, of course, clearly evidence-led. That shines through from your work, but your work did conclude or it did make a conclusion that supports the notion that male-born women taking part in some trans sports is unfair on female-born athletes with them competing in the same category. Has your faith in the public and the political and media class to have a sensible conversation been shaken at all in recent days uh, since your review's been published, Dr Hilton? I've been surprised at, for example, the policing of things like language and, and scientific words, scientific definitions like male and female, which I always try to use. I, I mean, I would defend them as entirely neutral terms in the first place and not, not descriptors of things like identity. But I try to use them respectfully sparingly and and in a non-provocative fashion and and to see that some people automatically from you know within their framework view them as provocative is has been quite surprising i mean most reasonable people the vast majority of people i would suggest are very very happy for people to live their lives the way they want to live their lives being fully supportive if a friend acquaintance or just you know another human being wants to change their identity and live in a different way. But don't you think quite a lot of people feel that this endless angsting over vocabulary is getting out of hand? And don't you think a lot of people feel a sort of general sense of natural injustice and even they're aghast when they see somebody who, while obviously a world-class athlete, was born a man, while obviously training hard, but competing in a category with female-born athletes. The issue is with the rules that have permitted Hubbard to participate. And I don't criticise Laurel Hubbard herself for participating. The issue is with the framework that has been set up to be inclusive before issues of fairness have been completely evaluated. That's an issue with the sports feds, and it's to them that I target my research. The general public don't have that kind of link with the sports federations. And what they are going to see is, is a pretty visual image, you know, some pretty visual imagery now. What they're going to see is, is something that's actually quite kind of shocking. The, the response to that is going to be very much directed at Laurel Hubbard. So, I, you know, that's going to be tricky to navigate in a way that, tries to keep everyone kind of calm and 
focused on the issues rather than, you know, we all know how social media responds to such things. But I think for the general public, this is really going to be a realisation that this is happening, that this is not some kind of theoretical, academically elite kind of hi- a hypothesis here, that this is really happening and that there are female athletes trying to compete, but without the advantage you know, the physical advantage that Hubbard has had for most of her life. And how will you respond if at the Olympics, if Hubbard does indeed win a medal, so becoming even more high profile, if one of the competitors, one of the female born competitors who doesn't win a medal because she has, cries foul? My response is... Let's get you in front of your sports federation. Let's make sure your voice is heard. Let's support you with the data we can find. Let's, let's make sure that your needs are being met here, that, that the sports federations are listening to you. But that's less likely to happen, surely, than that person crying foul being roundly condemned for being you know, lacking in, uh, shall we say, tolerance. It's really tough for female athletes, for any athlete to speak out when their sponsors and, you know, uh, team placements uh, are targeted for these kinds of harassments and, and abuse. So it is really hard when you do find someone who is willing to say, hang on, that's that doesn't seem fair, um, to try and support them because it seems that they're the exception to to a sporting world that is generally much more tolerant than this person is and therefore they should be kind of shunned. But let's be clear, to get to the Olympics, to compete for a medal, you know, is a life's work, right? And if you win a medal, your life after the Olympics is very different in terms of sponsorship, professional engagements, after dinner, speaking opportunities, all the rest of it. If you come forth at the Olympics, no one remembers who you are, frankly. And that's a great shame, but this is sport at the highest, highest level on the planet. So it wouldn't be surprising if Laurel Hubbard does win a medal and a female athlete pushed out of the medals by her then gets really upset. No, and I would absolutely understand that upset. I think in in that position, I would be very upset indeed. Just one final question, Dr. Hilton. Have you been fully supported by Manchester University, by the Wellcome Trust Centre for Cell Matrix Research, the other academic institutions, and there are many to which you are affiliated? There's a tendency to cast scientists as being naturally neutral, apolitical, that, that kind of thing. So so I think there's been a certain amount of protection offered by my discipline just in general and the, the public perception of scientists. And my institute have had complaints about me, um, but they have been explicitly supportive um, in person of my right to academic freedom of speech you know even if they'd rather quietly wish that I wasn't talking about this have you know made a firm commitment to my academic freedom of speech I hope that's extended to other academics here at Manchester in recognizing you know a great research institute really has a duty has a you know a, an ethical duty it's what academia is for for asking these tricky questions for letting people speak. Dr Emma Hilton developmental biologist at the University of Manchester. Thanks so much for joining us on Planet Normal. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fabulous. What a great guest, Liam. Now, really interesting listening to Emma Hilton, but she shouldn't have to be called brave for stating scientific truths, should she? I wrote about this in my column this week, and there's a young woman, Liam, a Tongan weightlifter, I'm going to try and pronounce her name, Kuininini Manamua. And she would otherwise have qualified for that Olympic weightlifting category. But her place, this 21-year-old female-born woman, her place was taken by Laurel Hubbard. And what we know about Laurel Hubbard, who is 43 years old and transitioned in 2012, 
previously named Gavin was a mediocre male athlete, didn't qualify for any international events, but after transition immediately became an off-the-charts female athlete. And as Emma Hilton told us, being born a boy or specifically going through male puberty gives you this massive physiological advantage, which doesn't go away when you transition and become a woman. And and like you, Liam, I mean, I have no problem with Laurel Hubbard or anyone else becoming a woman, being known as a woman. I've known women who felt they were trapped in the wrong body and they have had gender reassignment surgery and, and been much happier as a result feeling that they had been restored to their true selves. And I I celebrate that that's available to them. But a line has to be drawn when you are stealing the dreams of athletes who didn't get that rocket surge of testosterone. And I feel so strongly it's not transphobic to point out that it's just cheating. Yeah, you you, you make a very strong case, Alison. And it's a shame we do have to Uh, points out that Emma Hilton is being courageous, but she is being courageous. Of course, she's being courageous in the current climate. And let's hope that she doesn't get abused and cancelled in the modern vernacular for her scientific research. Um, I'm like you, Alison. I'm I'm a live and let live kind of guy. And and here's a sort of planet normal world exclusive. (laughs) Here we go. Your co-pilot spent a year working in a transvestite bar. Oh, wow. Wearing trousers or something a bit more exotic? No, wearing, wearing trousers. Shout out to the denizens of Bottoms Up Bar King's Cross in Sydney <laughs> in 88, where I was the head barman. And <laughs> I had, with many of the, the the clients there, the regulars there, it was largely a transvestite crowd. It was a, a sort of gay and transvestite bar. I was a straight guy working with another straight English guy in the bar. And I had a fantastic time and had with those regulars some of the most important conversations of my then very young life. Mm. They were tremendously supportive of me. They were somebody on the other side of the world. They were tremendously protective towards me. There was huge respect and even love between us. I got to know some of the trans women in that bar very very well and i've got a beloved photo album Mm -hmm. full of pictures of me with with them it's i I don't say that to curry any favor but just to try and establish that this is how i think and i know it's how you think we're liberal tolerant people and and yet it's just mad sorry i can't think of another word to have in a power sport somebody who's been through male puberty competing against somebody who was born a woman. I'm not saying that Laurel Hubbard isn't a woman. I'm not saying that. They can identify however they like, and it's up to us to respect how they identify. But to compete in a sport with a female-born athlete at the very highest level and pushing them out of the top slots just doesn't seem right to me at all. And if that's intolerant, then I'm intolerant. I think something that bothers me as a woman is seeing other women, many other women. I mean, we've got the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, the leader of the Conservative opposition, even Judith Collins, who said that you mustn't say horrible things about Laurel Hubbard. You mustn't object to her selection because that would be bullying. And this is what we see, Liam, again and again. Legitimate points of view, the objections which you and I and our guest have articulated, they are shut down as, you know, bullying inappropriate remarks. And I think it's frankly, it appalls me, particularly it's a generational thing. You know, you've got younger women who seem to be colluding in the erasure of their own sex. And I think, you know, women have spent, you know, the last century has been the century of women trying, you know, fighting for equality, fighting for women to be taken seriously in all areas of life and in sport. Amazing women like Martina Navratilova, Sharon Davis, who was a wonderful guest earlier on Planet Normal. And Sharon has said that Hubbard's selection is another kick in the teeth 
for female sport. These are feminist, strong women. Something I wrote about in the column again this week, I'm sure you saw it, Liam, was that St. Paul's Girls' School, of all places, one of the premier schools of the country, is abolishing the role of head girl because it's too binary, the word girl. They're going to change it to head of school. And the girls at St. Paul's Girls' School are now supposedly choosing from 150 gender identities. Now, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, really, because I think the work of feminism is not done. You know, you girls, the cleverest girls in the country, you're walking under the pavements you walk on are the bones and the hearts of the women who sacrifice themselves to give you the opportunities as young women that you have now. And you take up the cause of transgenderism and you defend people like Laurel Hubbard going into a woman's event in the Olympics when you know that she was born a male and will most likely obliterate the women who have trained so damn hard for that chance. And it really upsets me. We have seen the Aussie Sheilas fighting back Halligan, which did, ch- did cheer me up. Save Women's Sports Australia has accused the International Olympic Committee of betraying their sex. Women are not a hormone level, nor are we a self-declaration of a female gender identity. Shame on them. Well, I say, well said. Bin- Let's hear it, Halligan, for binary Sheilas with vaginas. And on that bombshell... Now it's time for our listener emails, a selection of the fantastic messages you send each week to Liam and me at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. We've got a bumper crop this week, but please do keep them coming because we absolutely love them. This is from Keely. I'm a mother of three boys, 16, 14 and 11. I'm chief financial officer in a large financial services business. With a heavy heart, a la Boris, I'm leaving my beloved UK in six weeks to live in New Zealand. My family are heartbroken, as am I. But I need to escape this dystopia and give my boys normal again. I luckily have this escape route via my husband, and I know others may not have the same option. But I simply can't contemplate living like this anymore. I have thought for over a year that once we began our lockdown journey, it would lead to a never-ending doom loop. But I optimistically hoped that our leaders were better than my downbeat assessment. Alas, also, Ala Boris, I've been proved correct. And so now I take my substantial tax pounds and those of my talented children with me for an old normal abroad. Yours sincerely, and with very many thanks to you both, Keely. Oh, that's very sad, Keely, that we're losing you. I think a lot of people feel like that. We get some devastating stories and these terrible things are still going on. This is from Claire. I thought I would tell you about my experience today. It's probably messed up my head more than anything the pandemic has thrown at us. A month ago, my friend from high school died. She had terminal cancer and was diagnosed last May. She spent the last year of her life being limited to her home, the hospital, and one last visit to Centre Parks with her two children, aged 8 and 11. When the funeral was announced, I was one of the lucky number of small people who were allowed to go. When I arrived at the church, the assistant took my name to check I was on the list. We were asked to sanitise and add our phone numbers for test and trace. Everyone had to wear a mask throughout the service, even though we were all socially distanced and mainly vaccinated. What I feel most sad about, when the coffin arrived with the kids walking behind, they saw a sea of eyes, no kind faces of their mum's family and friends. You could see them trying to recognise people. We were not allowed to sing. The church was half empty when it should have been full of people, celebrating the life of a 38-year-old taken too soon. If you arrived alone, you had to sit alone. You never get a second chance to have a funeral. And I don't feel my friend got the send-off she deserved. How can this be right? How can I process this cruelty in my head when I see a busy football match in the European Championships or hear about Wimbledon or Wembley where thousands and thousands will be allowed to gather? Thank God for Planet Normal. Keep going. 
because through you, I feel like I'm being heard, even if it does only feel like a whisper in the dark. Enough already, Boris. Enough. Enough. Let those, don't let people be treated like that. And let people be an ascot having fun and a friend can't bury her friend properly. It's not right. This is from M. Donovan. Our beloved family member who did not have COVID died because his outpatient and life-prolonging cancer treatment was discontinued as a precautionary measure and his end-of-life care was almost non-existent for the same reason. We were not alone in this situation. Our family promised ourselves if Mr Johnson, his full cabinet and sage, let in 2,500 non-quarantined elites to watch a football match while keeping the country in extended lockdown, with its continuing harm to medical care and the small business economy, we would all actively campaign to remove each and every one of them from power. They have shown themselves to be untrustworthy, manipulative and harmful phonies. And this is from Jill. For me, this is the last straw. My young children haven't seen their grandparents other than on Skype calls for two years. Yet a bunch of VIPs are allowed in quarantine free to the UK to watch a football match. I will now not comply with any COVID restrictions on principle. There's a lot of that about, Alison. We don't condone it, but there is a lot of that about. Well, I think that rebellion is very much in the air. And this is from Andrew. You'll like this, Liam. Which legal defence shall I use today? The G7, barbecue, the Ascot, toff, the Gove Portuguese, football, the UEFA, taking the piss, <laughs> or the Cummings eye test? <laughs> Clearly, the time has come for the plebs to take back what has been taken away by Messrs Johnson, Hancock et al. using their self-appointed pseudo-scientists. Once again, you have summed up just how disgracefully unfairly we are being treated. And a final one from me. This is from Bruce, again on the delay of Freedom Day. As we face one more heave of the wrecking ball, I can't say I'm surprised at this outcome. This government will always do what's politically expedient and far from facing a rebellion, I reckon the sun will bring out the lockdown lovers again. As Professor Bhattacharya said on Planet Normal, lockdowns protect the well-off, not the NHS. And of course, let's not forget the growing ranks of healthcare mafioso who are enjoying a beano that they're loath to end. It seems only Inspector Moltabano can sort this lot out because they will fight to become a permanent fixture in our lives. Lord Sumption may be right that the time has come for civil disobedience and as reluctant as we may be, all to disobey high-profile businesses such as Mr Lloyd Webber's taking matters into their own hands may allow opposition to coalesce. Only when public opinion rises above the propaganda pushed by ministries and media will this end. I'm sure Planet Norman will play its part. Talking of people playing their part, the excellent GB News began airing last evening. Imagine my surprise when the first guest I see on the Dan Wood show is... Alison Pearson. <laughs> I thought this was your gig, Liam. But then again, you can't keep a good woman down. <laughs> <laughs> Not letting you get away, co-pilot. I've got to keep a close eye on you. <laughs> this is from David. I may be the only person in these freedom-loving islands who wishes Boris to stay on as Prime Minister. After 50 years of marriage to a Yorkshire girl, this is the first time she has admitted to me that someone's utterances have left her speechless. Long may it continue. Um, little tiny one from Richard. How rich do you need to be to achieve COVID immunity? And you'll like this one, Liam, from Michael. You will be pleased to know that in my golf group, a hopeless shot is now known as a Hancock. <laughs> so that's it from Planet Noble for another week of that bombshell. <laughs> As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views, email a week, it's my call. I think it's got to be Keely. Because Keely, we want you to take your Planet Normal mug to New Zealand. We hope you can find room for it in your packing crates. We're sorry that you and your family are leaving our wonderful country. But email us your postal address and we'll send you that mug. We will be responding to your comments on the Telegraph website on Thursday morning, the day this podcast is released between 11 a.m. and 12 noon. And we'll put the link to that article in the description notes to this episode or just go to telegraph.co.uk 
I look for the article labelled Planet Normal. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal, and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers Louisa Wells, Isabel Bouchard and Elliot Lampett, and our editor Theodora Leloudis. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. And until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs>